now time to welcome Will from Rite of Passage. Hello, Will. Welcome to this workshop. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Matilda. Thank you for having me. Really, really excited to be here. Hey, everybody. Good to see all of you. Um, Matilda, we met back in Second Brain, what, like two and a half years ago? I know. We, we go met through courses back in the day, huh? Go way back. Yeah, yeah, this is exactly like the power of community-powered courses. You meet people in the course, and then you stay connected afterwards. Love it. Look at that. Isn't that great? Yeah. Really cool. It's so cool. I was about to say how it comes full circle. Uh, it's too much of a punt, so I got to not say that. <laughs> this is great. I'm uh, really good to be here, Matilda. And hey, everyone who's here, I just want to see by a show of hands, who's already... If you're already building, you've already built some version of a course, like it's already up and running, can you raise your hand? Great. And then if you're thinking about building a course, it's sort of on your mind, something you might want to do. Can you raise your hand? Really great. And then is anyone here just to learn about Circle as a platform, but is not interested in building courses at all? All right, we got a group of course builders. That's great. Just wanted to see uh, the room and see what's going on. Um, okay, so really excited to get into this today. My goal is to showcase what we've done at Rite of Passage over the last three years to give you all a look, number one, at what a course community can look like after it's, go after it's been going for a while, right? So we uh, began Rite of Passage, you know, it started back in 2019, and it was pretty small and pretty humble back then. I think our first live session, we had maybe 70 people on it. Uh, towards the end, we run these five-week courses. Towards the end of the course, we probably had about 15, 20 people on that live session. So it started real small. Our current cohort, we've got over 300 people from 41 countries. We've served over 1,000 students in the last three years. But I want to give you all a look at what this looks like after a couple of years. And then number two, I'd like you all to learn from our mistakes. So we've made plenty of mistakes about how to build a community, how to get people talking to each other, meeting each other, and achieving the outcome of the course. So I want you all to learn from what we did wrong, and then see a vision of what things can look like after you've had a lot of things go wrong and you finally start to get some things right. Um, but before we get into any of that, I have one more question. Is anybody a history buff? Does anybody like history? We've got a couple. Okay, great. I'm a history buff myself, so I have to start, just a moment, I have to start with a short clip uh, from U.S. history. All right, can everybody see this screen? Excellent. Here we go. Fire! Pause right there. This is the key moment from this clip. All right. Does anyone in the chat know what this is depicting by any chance? Everybody know the movie it's from? Yeah, it's a Tom Cruise movie, Far and Away. That, what you were just watching, was the Oklahoma land rush. So in 1892, there's all this land in the western part of the U.S., and the U.S. government said, okay, hey, on this day at 12 noon, we're going to open up all this land for settlement. And all those people rushed across the frontier all at the same moment. I'm sharing that because the world of online courses in 2022 is a lot like the world of Oklahoma in 1892. There's infinite potential out there. We're just getting started. The next decade to two decades, people will be pushing the frontier constantly of what's possible with online education. So today is just a little glimpse at what it looks like for us to be pushing the frontier in our corner of the internet. Love it. Love a good analogy to, to kick off a session. Got <laughs> well, to, got you know to. What you're doing. Be on the multimedia, you know, just get it started a little bit. Okay. Um, so let's jump in here. You guys can all see that? Yeah. Great, excellent. So again, uh, I'm Will, as Matilda said. Uh, I have been working on Rite of Passage for three years. Um, this is a look at our course. We promise to transform your life through writing online, accelerate your career. We'll talk about uh, our mission and all that in a moment. As we just mentioned, talked about the Oklahoma land rush of 1892. This is the world of online courses and so excited for you all to be pushing the frontier alongside of us. And as mentioned, three goals for today. Number one, I want you to learn from the mistakes we've made, draw insights from the successes that we've had. And finally, I want to leave you with some topics to ponder of your own. So quick more context on Rite of Passage. We've run nine cohorts of Rite of Passage. So we are not an always on course. We're not an asynchronous course. We're a live cohort-based course. That means it's delivered over a five-week period. There's a start date and an end date. During those five weeks, it's real intense, right? We'll get students from all around the world 
They're live on calls together. They're writing together. They're exchanging, <clears throat> writing feedback. So we run two of these cohorts per year. So we can see we do about 200 new students per year. Then we also get alumni coming back. So we've got 364 students in our current cohort nine, which is running right now, 60 countries, 1,500 plus students. Three commitments of rite of passage will help all of our students publish quality ideas. We're here to write. That's the number one thing. But notice our second commitment is we help people find their people. If you join rite of passage, you'll find your people, people who have similar interests, whether it's in career, personal interests, writing interests. One of our three core commitments to our students is oriented around community and helping people meet others. And the third one, as Matilda said, is 2x your potential. Whether that looks like growing an audience, changing careers, expressing yourself creatively, finding friends, you're going to 2x your potential if you take Rite of Passage. Just a bit more context, this is the team we have now. So we have 10 people full-time running this course. And our full team for a cohort expands to 38. So it's the full-time staff plus teams of mentor mentors who support students day-to-day -day with the implementation of our concepts and team of editors who edit, ev who edit every single piece of student writing. So it's a big team, but it started like this. Myself and David and a bunch of sticky notes. We believe in the power of sticky notes at Rite of Passage. Every piece of the course that I just showed you that I will show you began on a two-by-two two slip of paper and some Sharpie. And we got a team retreat right now for the new high school product we're building. I was just with that team 10 minutes ago, and they got sticky notes and Sharpies going right now. So bringing it back to whatever stage you're at, uh, this is where we started to. Um, and it's just shared, those were our core commitments. So today there's two things, uh, big picture things I want to talk about. The first part, about 10, 15 minutes, just want to walk you through the core building blocks of our course. So just to give you a picture of what it looks like, uh, what we deliver for students. And as we're delivering this, think about which parts really resonate with you. You might say, hey, that's something I want to bring into my course. Then other things might not resonate at all. And you might not want to do that for whatever you're teaching, but we'll show you what we've got. And then the second part, we're going to talk about community. And I've got the three S's of community, sea turtle, sensei, and scientist. I'll show you what that means in just a little bit. And the first thing is the course building blocks. So I used to talk about rite of passage. I would say these are the three core ingredients of rite of passage, the curriculum, the live sessions, and the community. You notice the curriculum was on a platform called Teachable. Of course, Zoom for live sessions and community was on Circle. But we don't use Teachable anymore. We have shifted all of our curriculum to circle as well. So our three ingredients are circle for our course curriculum, Zoom for the live sessions, and circle for our community. So first, we'll take a look at the curriculum rite of passage. Uh, this is just a glance uh, at our entire circle community. I'll go into some depth of the different pieces. Uh, when students enroll in rite of passage, they're added to a start here section where we give them exact steps of what to do to get going in the course. So this is all housed in circle. It's the first place they go when they enroll in the course. And we host all sorts of curriculum elements in the course. You'll see the initiation survey before they start. In our opening week of the course, we share a session called How to Get Crazy Value Out of Rite of Passage. Students attend live, and then we put the recording up on Circle. And then all of our live sessions. So David Perel is the instructor. He teaches 12 live sessions over five weeks. We put all the recordings on Circle. Again, this used to be on a different platform. We've housed it all in our Circle community. It's just putting the videos on Wistia, and that could be a private YouTube video, that could be Vimeo, we use Wistia, and then embedding those videos into Circle. It's a perfect video player. It's really simple UI for our students. When our students join before the first session, we have them do what's called build week, which means there's certain writing infrastructure they need to have ready on day one. So they set up websites, they build start here pages, they set up info capture systems. So we have videos walking them through every step, plus written instructions, which we also share on Circle. So we get students all ready to go. And then we have our kickoff, which is our first live session. So here's an example of what a live session looks like. Uh, you know, we'll have in the beginning, in the old days, we'd have, you know, down to, I think one session, we got down to 16 people, right? The course was really shrinking. And then things sort of turned around. And now this is what a live session will look like. So our kickoff live session, we had... I think this year is it's 277 people all around the world, which is thrilling. Our typical live session will be about 150 to 170 people. And these are Zoom calls, but they're not your typical boring lecture, right? You picture in college, you just sit in a big room of 200 people and listen to your professor lecture and lecture and lecture. They teach writing kind of like this. But our Zoom calls have a great variety of different topics that we cover. We teach writing through the lens of 
novelists, architecture, pop culture, athletes, rappers, actors, poets. We keep things really engaged. And it's not just David teaching. There's all sorts of ingredients we use to make a life such dynamic. We use state changes where people are listening to David for the first few minutes, and then they do a live writing exercise. And then they jump in a breakout room for 10 minutes and discuss that exercise. And then we do a group discussion for five minutes in front of the whole group. It's really dynamic 90 minutes where we're never sharing a lecture style presentation for more than 10 minutes. And you know, in, in Circle, we got the Zoom chat lighting up now. I see there's 18 comments in the Zoom chat. Our Zoom chat is electric on these live sessions. The community pours their ideas, their thoughts, their feedback to the session while David is teaching. So it's a bi-directional two-way pattern of learning. So what you see here, this slide is some screenshots from our live session Zoom chat. All these screenshots are from eight minutes of Zoom. So our sessions are 90 minutes. So you can get a sense of how long and how engaged the Zoom chat is. A couple more things I'll talk about. When you think about teaching an online course, sometimes you think, hey, you just turn on Zoom, you do your teaching and that's that. We're meticulous about every single detail that we teach in our live sessions. We have a saying we love, it's a great product is subtlety compounded over time. So what that means is we have showrunners for every single session. This is a production. We keep a tight schedule down to the minute in Notion. We have a countdown clock before the session starts, the session de delivered in a professional way, but we're meticulous about every single moment. We have this back channel on WhatsApp. This is from last night where nine of us on the team are texting each other saying, hey, David, speed up a little bit here. Hey, we're, we're running long. Let's cut this section and move down to the exercise. So we're really thoughtful. And then we have debriefs after every session. Sometimes we'll spend an hour after each and every session going through every single detail of what went right and what went didn't. So this is a look at our debrief notes from our, some of our sessions from this cohort. So the main takeaway for you all here is that teaching these sessions can seem like just turn on your Zoom camera and start talking, but to really engage the community, to really make sure every minute counts, that people are engaged. It's this focus on details and subtlety over time that delivers really great sessions. And then we send some takeaways uh, at the end. Um, until then, I wanna pause here. Just, I've been talking a lot myself. Any questions in the chat? Anything you wanted to jump into right now? Yeah, thanks for this great overview. First and foremost, it's great to see like, you know, the evolution from the small cohort to the big one. Of course. Um, we had a question from, Jeffrey was asking if you're using the courses feature on Circle just yet or a regular post space and your thoughts on that. Because of course we just released a new, a new space type for courses. So where are you at with Rite of Passage? 100%. So Rite of Passage started on October 5th. I think courses mining on live on October 7th, until you know, it was right after the course started. So yeah. we're not using the courses feature for this course, but I've seen some really cool stuff that Circle's done there. I think it's in particular really good for delivery of content for students to watch you know, before a live session, just delivery of content seems really smooth. So yeah. we're not on it just because of a funny timing, uh, but we're taking a hard look at that for our next cohort, which will be in February and March. Yeah, great to hear. We had the same thing with the bootcamp. Somebody was asking, why are you not running the bootcamp in a course space? Well, because course, courses were still in beta and we were trying to like, you know, uh, use the best space type for, for the job as well. That's right. Uh, awesome. Um, yeah, and I just think, what, uh, you know, we're not even using the, the courses feature, and yet Circle is so well designed for courses. I can't wait to show you guys some more ways. Yeah, it. because you were you were one of the first, you were one of the early adopters of Circle, like two years ago, very first customers. And so before, it's because of, thanks to people like you, that we decided to build a full-fledged course feature, seeing what, how powerful learning and community can be, that we were like, we have to offer a better way for folks okay. out there to, to host their content and, and facilitate those connections around the content. So yeah, yeah. I'm laughing just because I later in the deck, I have some slides with the old, old, old circle looked like it was January, 2020. Oh, amazing. I think we were alpha tester. It had just launched. Uh, it was a mess largely because of us and, and the platform was new. Um, so we've come a long way and y'all have come a really long way since then, but yeah, it's been great to be with y'all since day one. So yeah. I love it. We can go down memory lane for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me, Jump back into things. Okay, so now that, that was just an overview of uh, our curriculum content and the live sessions, but the real thing we're here to talk about today is community. We're here to talk about community in the context of courses. And, and we believe in community at Rite of Passage, but why do we believe in community? Why is this such an important ingredient for running great, great courses? And it comes down to something Seth Godin has shared in the past. A lot of you probably know Seth Godin. Seth is a great thinker on topics of community. 
marketing, course building, all of that. And this is a long quote, but the main thing to focus on what Seth says here is that we're all here to teach people something. We want our students to learn something. But every time you learn something, by definition, you're confronting something that you don't know, something new. And that's really hard. That's scary, right? And so back in the day, called sometimes Online Education 1.0, there was these MOOC courses where you'd have 10,000 people just watching content alone. That was considered a course. But the thing is, when you're confronting something scary, when you're learning something, it's really easy just to close your laptop, right? Especially when there's no official degree uh, at the end. So people just leave. And so the thing that community does is bring people together and have them move through this journey together. And so I'll show you a whole bunch of different ways that we bring our students together, have each other, have them support each other and deliver great outcomes for our students. Um, that's where the official reason, it's also just the heart of the course. Like we say, Rite of Passage is a place for people with their hearts on fire. And that is the essence of the Rite of Passage community. People who love ideas, who love writing, who are excited to talk about others who feel the same way about ideas and writing. So hopefully we'll give you a sense of that as we go through uh, this next part of the presentation. I want to show you guys how we build community. And has anyone been, man, I think it's, I think it's like Buenos Aires, Argentina. Has everybody been there? They put it in the chat, raise your hand. It also might be Spain. This is, <laughs> I don't know where the tango is the most popular dance. And if you know, put it in the chat. But we think about course building in terms of dancing the tango. What do I mean by this? How is building an online course like dancing the tango? Well, <clears throat> In course building, sometimes you do things top down. You engineer a community. You say, hey, these students are going to go do this. These people are going to be grouped in this way. You're engineering things top down. But there's this other way to build a course, which is where things come bottom up. You just pe put people in a group and say, hey, go create your own spaces. Go schedule your own Zoom calls. And you can't have too much of either. If you go too top down, it suffocates the community. But if you're too bottom up, it just dissolves. It's like a gas. There's not enough structure there. So it's this fluid movement between the top down and the bottom up design, this tango between these two elements that allows you to build a great course. So I'm going to show you what I mean by top down and bottom up. But I used to have this assumption that it was my responsibility running the course to design and deliver the perfect experience. That's not true. There's these different layers and some are designed by me and the team, but a lot of others bubble up bottom up. And so to talk about community, we're going to look through the lens of these three stories, baby sea turtles, senseis, and scientists. It's just a little teaser. We're going to start with my friends, the baby sea turtles. So I used to watch these nature documentaries as a kid. Maybe you all did too. But you know those clips where there's like a thousand baby sea turtle eggs and they all hatch and they're all running to the ocean. But a lot of them don't make it, right? Like a lot of baby sea turtles either get too hot and get baked in the sun, or there's seagulls that swoop down and, and grab them. But some of the baby sea turtles make it to the ocean, and they live for decades, dozens of years. I view our 300 students who come in each cohort, 200 new, 100 returning, like baby sea turtles, right? In the world of online courses, there's a lot of gulls that are going to snatch up those baby sea turtles, not let them get to the finish line. There's a hot sun baking down on them, the pressure of the time commitment and the fear of publishing online. And so our goal as a team is to design some elements top down that help those baby sea turtles get to the ocean, right? We have another metaphor for you, but we talk about rite of passages like Coachella for writing. There's so many different things that we offer students, but the key, the key is to design certain elements in a way that ensures that students move through and have success in the course. So we have these different sizes of the courses, the live sessions I spoke about, those are almost entirely top down. We design every single minute of those experiences. But as you get smaller, you sort of release that top-down grip and down to these mentor groups and one-on-one -on -one connections, it's largely bottom up, okay? But to get the sea turtles of the ocean, the top-down stuff is like build week, like I talked about. The moment you join the course, there's exact steps for what you need to do to get ready for a kickoff session. There's videos from David, videos from myself, walking you through exactly what needs to be done. That's not bottom up, that is expressly top-down. Because in that early stage, students are the most shaky, the most vulnerable. We need to get them to exactly where they need to be. We hold a welcome call with every single student who joins the course. We used to do these one-on-one. -on -one. That was a bit crazy. So now we do these in groups of four. We have a whole team of alumni who are ambassadors who hold these calls with students. And then over the five weeks of the course, as students move through the course, 
these ambassadors track their students in a backend system we've built in Airtable. So you can see the green there. These are our top students from the current cohort. They're doing great. This engagement score, combination of are they joining sessions? Are they going to mentor groups? Are they submitting their articles each week? Tells us if they're performing well. And you'll note in this red box, all the ambassadors have their subgroup. But some of the students aren't doing well. I didn't put the names in here, but these are some of our students who are falling behind this course. You'll see the yellows and the reds. So what that means is if you're an ambassador and your students are falling behind, it's like a baby sea turtle who's got a gull swooping down. It's getting real hot in the sun. And it's your job to jump in, fend off that gull, hold a call with them. You message them. We're doing that this week. The second week of the course, if people are falling behind, our ambassadors shoot the messages on circle and say, hey, I noticed you're falling behind a bit. How's everything going in the course? Can we support you? What can we do? Can we jump on a call? So that's our top-down responsibility to make sure students get through the course. And we also measure circle engagement. So we're actually using analytics to see who is active on circle and who's quieter. So the first phase, baby sea turtle, it's completely top down, helping those baby sea turtles get to the ocean, continue attending all five weeks, publish their articles all five weeks. Because if you don't have really thoughtful top down approach in this part, a lot of students will stop, a lot of students will drop off. All right, Matilda, I'm gonna pause there again. I've been talking a lot. Any questions from you, any questions from the chat? Love to take a moment right now. Yeah, for sure. I have a quick question on, so you mentioned all the different levels of connection and the need for having, you know, small groups, bigger groups, one-on-one -on -one connections. I love the fact that you're doing follow-ups as well. Um, what would you recommend to someone who is just getting started? They're a team of one. They only have mm -hmm. time for one or two touch points, community touch points, as we call them. Um, do you have a sense of like, would you have one that you would recommend in particular? Is it like doing one-on-one -on -one DMs? Is it having a, you know, a coaching session every week with your with your group? Um, yeah, thoughts on that. If you're a team of one just getting started, like what do you prioritize? Or how do you go about thinking at, at those touch points? Yeah, the mindset, the good mindset to hear to have here is doing things that don't scale. Some of you may have heard that. It's a big thing in entrepreneurship. Somebody may be, some of you maybe haven't heard that. Um, when I started with David, day one, David's whole thing was like, we have to be able to scale. We want to grow right of passage to the moon. And we found this video from Patrick Carlson at Stripe. It had like 13,000 views. And his whole thing was like in the early days, do things that don't scale. So Matilda, to answer your question, I would look to have a way to have a one-on-one -on -one personal touch point with every student in your course in the early days. Um, for What that looked like for us is I had a 20 to 30 minute call with every single student in the first four cohorts, one-on-one. -on -one. It was a huge investment of time but it really showed that we cared. Half of it was to help the student and talk about the substance. The other half was literally just a signal to say, hey, we're the type of course that's going to book dozens, if not hundreds of one-on-one -on -one calls with their students to see how they're doing. And it helps the student, but it also helps you as the course builder. Because if you have enough student conversations, you pick up these intuitions about where students are at and what they need. And it really serves you as you build the course. Um, the other quick thing I would say is I recommend not doing this alone. Course building is really hard. On the outside looking in, it's like, oh, you just stand up a course. It's going to be a breeze. I'm going to make a bunch of passive income. It's really tough. There's so many little details that pop up. So I really recommend, say you've run, uh, say you've been running a course for like even a month or two, grab somebody who's really into your stuff and, and bring them on even as a volunteer or pay mm. them a little bit as a contractor and have some support. It's really hard to do this alone. Yeah, and that's why you've involved your ambassadors really well over time, right? Just like making sure that you get the support from the community, from the course itself, not just from, from your team, which I, I think is a really smart move. Um, quick question from the chat as well. We'll have some proper time for Q&A at the end as well. Um, any of those air tables or resources available as templates somewhere, Hussein is asking, or are you thinking they're, of offering them as templates if they're not already out there? <laughs> they're not. We are not. No, that's just... Uh... Yeah, maybe one day, but right now it's just something we've built internally. But I will say, I mean, there's a lot of people who have great public material shared on this. Uh, Julia Saxena, Andrew Barry come to mind. They're both Rite of Passage alums. They've gone into course building themselves. I mean, Julia, I don't know if we get this link in the chat or something, but Julia Saxena has like an entire Notion playbook yes, of all the things that it takes to like get a course started. I actually wouldn't focus on the Airtable. So we've been doing this for th three years. We built that Airtable in August, right? Like that's not the right thing to start with. The right thing to start with is anecdotal, checking in with people, watching your circle analytics. That's like way down the line. Um, and I wouldn't recommend starting with that. I love this. So as a, as a first step, and also going back to your response from earlier, it's kind of like 
doing things that don't scale, maybe optimizing your learning, things that are gonna give you a lot of insight as a course creator versus the things that might look pretty or that might be like, you know, just uh, comprehensive and give you a full picture of where your students are at. I love that. Yeah. In the early days, data is way overrated. Like we basically didn't look at data for two years. Quantitative data, that is. We just, it was David and I, we're both right brain creatives. We had no systems for really capturing data. Like we collect these surveys and hardly even use them. But you can get so far just off your intuition. Data gets important to help uh, supplement the decision-making process as you get bigger. But in the early days, it's intuition, it's conversations. We also have dozens of feedback calls with students after every cohort. Things like that are way more important than tracking all the stats to start. And again, this is just showing like, the end product after three years, and it's not necessarily a recommendation to do all this right away. I love it. Okay. Cool. Do you want to carry on? We'll we'll definitely keep all the questions from the chat and and save them, add them to the replay as well, so we can. Uh, Wonderful. We will press on to stage number two, the sensei. I've never seen Karate Kid, but I'm told this clip, this photo comes from uh, Karate Kid. But uh, yeah, the uh, <clears throat> second piece here is. Why it's called sensei, it's just a word that means teacher that starts with S, so it fits with my other two. But the reason we call it sensei, teacher, is that we realized that if it was just David and I running this course, there's way too many people for the value just to be flowing from the two of us. We realized early on we needed uh, a team of people who we could train, who could then go work with students and train the students. So enter the mentor program, right? The alumni mentor program, we have 14 mentors this cohort, they've all taken the course, started writing online, done really well, and then they apply and come back and serve as mentors for our students. So David's been writing online for five, six, seven years. He's the main teacher in the live sessions. Some of his advice isn't actually the most helpful advice, right? Like the most helpful advice for somebody who's just starting out is often the person who just did the same thing four months before they did. And that's why our mentors are so valuable. So each mentor runs their own one hour live session each week for five weeks. So this cohort, that's 70 additional hours of sessions. They're not recorded. You got to be there live because the recording would just be too much. But each mentor has a different focus area. They have bios and videos. Students sift through, find the mentor that most resonates with them and joins their sessions. So I'll map out a typical week for a rite of passage student and why these teachers, these trained teachers are so important to what we do. So the live sessions with David are twice a week. And then the articles that you publish, those are the heart of the course. Those are the most important pieces. If you don't have time for anything else, we say do that. But we offer these 14 mentor sessions all throughout the week, one hour sessions, right? And then on top of that, we have those ambassadors that I mentioned earlier, run what we call writing gyms and feedback gyms every single day. So students can join and write silently for an hour every morning and get one-on-one -on -one feedback in breakout rooms with one of our ambassadors every afternoon. This is a ton of stuff. It's sort of overwhelming, right? But we just tell students to make a plan. We have all these teachers this whole team that we've trained to make the course great for you, don't do it all. Just go through the week, pick one or two mentor groups, one or two gyms to attend, and leave everything else out. So these are our senseis, our teachers, right? As I mentioned, our 14 mentors who have done really well in Rite of Passage and come back to help teach students. Uh, on top of that, uh, article feedback. So students write drafts of articles each week, and then they get feedback, and then they publish. But the feedback process used to be broken. So it's another mistake we made, right? Like students would do peer feedback, but a lot of articles just wouldn't get any feedback at all. So if you're a student in a writing course, you're not getting any feedback, it's a pretty bad experience. So we said, hey, we need some more senseis. So we hired 10 editors, trained them with our editor-in-chief, who's an absolute wizard at giving feedback, uh, trained them on how to give great article feedback. So they uh, give feedback to every single article that's, that's published each week. I think we had... 225 to 250 articles uh, draft shared the first week of our course here in October. These editors gave feedback to every single one. Again, fancy air table. We had this uh, for the last six months. We did not have this for the first two and a half years, but this is the system we use in the back end to make sure every single student gets feedback. And this is what article feedback looks like. It's in a Google Doc. It's specific, thoughtful comments about how the article will be stronger and what you're already doing well. And again, just a glance at uh, all the articles is a bit blurry, but in a given week, all the article feedback that these senseis, these editors, are delivering for our students. Oh, it, it moves apparently. So, there's, there's <laughs> love that. it. Quick, quick question, Will. Before you move on, um, some people are asking in the chat if you are if you are compensating your mentors, or is it a voluntary thing? Yeah, we pay. Um, we pay everyone, but I will say again, like they started out unpaid. So our first time we had mentors, I think it was our fourth cohort. 
Um, and they didn't even run a one hour session. It was just, they were there to support uh, on circle and they were unpaid, they were volunteer. But those mentors then, you know, that, that initial seed grew into the mentor program we have today where we bring them in two months early. We do like six or seven hours of training uh, and they're all paid, uh, they're contractors. So we, we pay our mentors and we pay our editors. Uh, but just keep in mind, it started really small. It started with seven people, all volunteer based. And Julia and Andrew, who I mentioned earlier, they're now building their own courses. They started as mentors in that first cohort. Um, so yeah. Um, I guess I'll give a quick note. This is not my deck too, but uh, I think a mistake a lot of course builders make is not charging enough. Our course is not cheap. Uh, it's $4,000 for five weeks or $7,000 to get lifetime access. But we don't compete on price. We compete on value. We deliver a tremendous amount of features, but the real thing we deliver is outcomes, value, results. Students take our course, they build writing habits, they 2X their potential, they find their people, they publish quality ideas. And so we just decided from the start, you know, there's so many courses that are saying, hey, I'm $199, all free, you know, all async content. We said, no, we're going to build an exceptional product and we're going to charge a lot because we're competing on value, not price. And that's what allows us to hire this team of mentors, this team of editors. It's not the right approach for everyone. For a lot of people, the more inexpensive course is a great option. It depends what you're trying to do, right? If you're trying to build a course as a part-time thing, good chance that will be the right option. But if you want to be a teacher, if you want to be an educator, uh, competing on value over price can be a really helpful framework to think about. We have so many questions from the chat, but we can maybe take them at the end, Will, unless you want to... Yeah. You, let, you let me know when you want to pause and take questions. No doubt. <laughs> um, yeah, let's talk about... No, let's take a question. This section is kind of my longest one. So let's take a question now and then we can jump to the third third piece. Yeah, so on the on the business model front, Megan is asking, what's the difference between the cohort and then a lifetime lifetime plan, sorry? The only difference is that you can come back as a student in future cohorts. Hmm. Um, there's a bit of uh, content you get, some bonus uh, async material, but the real value is that you get to come back and be a student in future cohorts. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Great. Um, what else do we have? How long between planning the course and starting the first cohort? So when you go back in time, when you and David were planning the first planning the first cohort, how long did you? How long did that take you? If I understand the question correctly. Yeah. So I'm I, just a quick history. So I'm, I met David uh, just through Twitter in 2018. We got dinner in LA. We'd read some of the same books. Uh, and at that dinner, David said, "Hey, I've got this idea. I want to teach a dozen people to write online. And that's pretty cool. I'd do like a little writing fellowship." Uh, two weeks late, later, he fired off a tweet to his audience. He said, I want to teach a thousand people to write online. I don't know what happened in those two weeks, but the ambitions really uh, grew. And so from that tweet to the first cohort, it was about five months. Um, I actually started, I was a student in that first cohort. At the end of the course, I just said, David, the course is great, but it can be so much better. Here's some ideas. And I started with David at that point. Um, and it was real small at that point, um, but it was about five months from idea to first cohort. And then we used to do like a month or two between fast iteration cycles. Now we're about four or five months in between. Got it. And it's a nice segue to John's question. And then we'll we'll go back to the presentation for now. Great. Um, John is asking, how much feedback from your community have you implemented in your coursework? So you mentioned that the first cohort, um, kind of like you shared some feedback with, uh, you know, uh, with David and then that was implemented. And so moving forward, how much of the course has evolved directly due to feedback that you got from the community? Yeah, I mean, a, a tremendous amount. Uh, the entire course is based on feedback. I mean, we we teach feedback in the writing process. We also follow that in the course building process. Um, I, you know, like an example is when I first started with David after that first cohort, I had calls probably 35 or 40 students, 30 minutes each, just to see, hey, what'd you like about the course? What could be better? And that directly led to us teaching this thing called information capture that wasn't in the course before. And we have those calls after every round, we do surveys. Um, Mattel, I can share something really quick here, I think will be interesting. Um, and then we can get back to the presentation, but this is, these are our version notes. We basically treat course building like software. I can put this in the chat too. Um, but going all the way back to that second cohort, like here's just all the changes we made in each version of the course. And so you'll see like, it's just almost all of these, some of these came from David and I, like being in the course and be like, hey, we could add this, we could add that. I'd say 75, 80% of this were ideas from our community about how to make the course better that we then took uh, and implemented. I uh, love that. It's like the, so, your own GitHub, uh, your own version control for your course. 
Yeah, okay. yeah, sure. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> um, <laughs> we are we are unabashedly liberal arts folks. So we are not hackers or programmers, but if this is the liberal arts version of GitHub, uh, I'll take it. <laughs> you are well. It sounds like you are you're borrowing from 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 tech, but probably not. You're just uh, doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, it, it is inspired by that, no doubt. But it's our own like yeah. liberal arts spin on the whole hacker ethos. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Awesome. Okay. Let's go back to your press, and then we'll we'll take more questions in the time that we have. Onward. Okay. Excellent. Thanks everyone, by the way, those are great questions. I mean, I'm, I'm just like, I wish we had more time to cover them all, but we'll, we'll cover a bunch. <laughs> okay, so this is scientist mode number three. So remember we started with the sea turtles, which was completely top down. Sensei is this mix of top down and bottom up. The final part of this tango is scientist mode, which would, means for the smallest units of community, which is one-on-one in small groups, you cannot design those top down in my experience. They have to emerge bottom up, but it's not completely bottom up. It's not a gas, it's more of a liquid. We put certain barriers and certain containers in place and then have, you know, try these experiments and then watch the community flourish. So we've got a lot of things wrong and lately we think we've got a few things right. So I'm excited, excited to share this with you. Our whole goal with this bottom-up community is increasing students' serendipity surface area, particularly in the first week, right? Because the whole thing about community is people need to meet others for it to be sticky for them to not leave when things get tough. So our whole thing with bottom-up community is how can we design an experience where others can meet each other, make friends, and then they don't want to leave. Uh, but we got this really wrong. So in cohort four, you can see this in the version notes. We said, man, we need some way for students to have these smaller group units. You know what we need? Feedback groups. We said article feedback won't be a big post and circle for everyone. There'll be these separate groups. This is my big grand idea. I thought it was brilliant. I took a spreadsheet of all of our students. I think we had 150 students that cohort. I broke them into these groups. And let me tell you something. These groups were 100% arbitrary. There was no rhyme or reason to how we created these groups other than did a random sort and put people into groups. Uh, you'll get a little peek at the old circle UI here. We put these uh, students into groups and you'll notice there are no comments on any of these posts. We could not pay people to post in these groups. It was a nightmare. Now, why was that? Well, there was no common thread with the people in the groups. There's no common interest. There's no common geographic location. It was absolutely entirely arbitrary. And we were trying to force people into community by designing it top down. Look at this spreadsheet. This is the definition of like Soviet era top down planning. Did not work. Did not work. So we had to go a little free market. Our turning point was flipping these groups from opt out where you're forced in to opt in where you got to choose your own mentor group, right? You got to choose your own mentor group. Those are our old feedback groups, mentor groups were top down. Instead, we said, hey, we got a bunch of mentors. You decide, you know how busy you are. If you're busy, these mentor groups, these one hour weekly sessions are totally supplementary. You don't have to go to any. If you love this course, if you feel so moved, you can go to 14 hours of mentor groups. It's up to you. And what happens is students start saying, I noticed they'd say like, hey, I'm in Le Lev's group. I'm in Jackie's group. I'm in Shelby's group. They started to identify with these groups because they chose the time slots and the mentors and the interests that appealed to them most. And so we end up having this extremely vibrant part of the course. The mentor program is the most vibrant part of the Rite of Passage community. It's the heart of the whole course. But the key flip was not trying to design it top down. It was flipping around the tango and having it be a science experiment that bubbled up from bottom up. Two other things I want to talk about with bottom up community, then I'll pause and jump to the chat, so or jump to the question. So the first thing is interest groups. So in Circle, you'll see uh, when our students join Circle, they're able to have a space where they can create their own posts of common interests. So you'll see here, I mean, there's there's absolutely dozens of these on our community right now, people who like fitness and weight training, people who like, you know, uh, who are interested in AI, uh, a women's group, podcasters. There's dozens of these groups in our community. So we don't design any of these. This is a container we create and then people fill this with things they're most interested in. And a really cool thing we do here, we've added this recently. Remember in your university days, at least I went to University of Virginia, we had something called club day. Your first day as a freshman, there was tables on the lawn with 800 different clubs you could join. It was the most exciting thing to me as an 18 year old starting college. So we recreated club day on Zoom. So we look at all the interest groups on Circle and we do a special Zoom call called club day where we just have 20 breakout rooms is all these different topics and students get to choose which breakout rooms they join. We do three rounds of 20 minutes each. So students get to jump into these groups and meet others, right? So they tell us which groups to make. It's not up to us. 
whatever in circle are the groups we make. And then they have the agency. They have the autonomy to hop into the groups they want. They can jump between groups on this call and they meet others. And after this call, circle lights up. It was so popular. We're running two more of these, this cohort. We hadn't planned that, but people love club day. So again, all we did, we didn't design it from the top down. We created a container and let this experiment bubble up, bottom up. And the last thing is location groups. So these are groups where, uh, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory. Where are you in the world? Uh, you know, you have all sorts of different posts here. You can see stuff, you know, place in the U.S., Southeast Asia, Australia, India, Montana, Montenegro, Taiwan. Uh, just last night, I live in L.A., but I'm here in Austin uh, for a few weeks. And we had an Austin meetup, about 25 people at a restaurant. It was an absolute blast. So we have people, we allow this experiment to bubble up, bottom up as well. People meet each other in person too, which is a lot of fun. Future Frontiers, uh, this is sort of the end of the presentation here. Um, we, let's see, we are building Rite of Passage for high schoolers. That's our next frontier. Um, we're also just looking to make the course better and better. Uh, we proud, we're proud of where the course is now, but there's so many places to make it better. And I just love this process of feedback, collecting feedback, making it better each time. We do retrospectives, we do team retreats. There's so many different ways to make this course better. It can only cover so much in an hour. Um, but I want to end with this. It's so exciting. Please, I, everyone, unmute yourself. Oh, you want to end with something? I, I've got one final thought. I want to sort of, <laughs> I'm sorry, I want to make I all dramatic. I, told them, I didn't tell you about this. Um, I can see the gallery view right now, so I can see almost all of you. Who grew up in a place where it was really cold, like where it snowed in the winter? I did. I live in Virginia. Okay, great. So think about that first snow of the year. What do you do when it snows for the first time? You run outside, you make a little snowball. And sometimes that's it, and that snowball just melts. But other times you start pushing that snowball down a hill, and it grows bigger and bigger and bigger. So all the things you just saw, they're the snowballs that didn't melt, that made it to the bottom of the hill. In course building, there's this principle. You just have these little bets each cohort. They're just little snowballs. And some fail. We tried something called feedback pods once. I didn't learn my lesson about top down. I tried to put every student into groups of five. Failure. They were totally dead. That snowball melted. But the mentor program, this program with trainings and teachers and payments started with a Zoom call with eight people the day before our fourth cohort started. This editor program with dashboards and tables it started as a WhatsApp group with five people. So think about the snowballs you want to make now and start rolling them down the hill. Some will melt, but the ones that don't will get bigger and bigger and bigger until they're the foundation of your course. So thanks a lot, guys. I'll pause there. And Matilda, let's uh, jump to any questions. And that is the cue for clapping for Will. Woohoo! <laughs> awesome. Oh my God, Will. Amazing. I'm not going to speak too much because I want to make time for live questions, but that was amazing. Oh. You were the king of analogies. I think there were tons in there that people will start using moving forward. Um, let's, take, let's take some live questions. So to ask a question, just raise your Zoom hand, keep it short and sweet, very short, one question at a time so we, can, we make space for, for everyone. All right. Uh, Sarah, you're, you're up. What's your question? What do you want to know more about? <laughs> Hey, uh, thank you so much. Well, it was amazing. My right. question would be um, when it's the beginning of the like the launch uh, the launch period, what would you advise us to focus on, like to create that amazing momentum? Because I tried it once and it was a total fail. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to find this like hype to create, like the cohort we did. So yeah. I'm wondering how to do it. Yeah. A big thing for us, we have our kickoff session. That's the first live session. Um, you, when you enroll in the course, that's still like 10 days away. In the early days, we would sell, sell, sell to the, we have this launch window. So we sell for like two weeks and then the course runs. I um, mean, you can't buy before that. So the launch window used to go up till Tuesday and then the course would start on Wednesday. And then we moved back to Monday and then we added a whole week. So basically students get in, they have all this time to prepare, but all of our messaging is pointing people towards this kickoff session. And that kickoff session is electric. Like people join that and we say it's Zoom like you've never seen it before. And if we can get them in that first session, they really get a taste of it. Then they'll go to our bonus sessions the first week. They'll join some mentor groups and then they start meeting people and you've got them. So I think it's just having a big kickoff event where people really see the power of your community. Um, just think about one thing you can do. It gives people a taste of what's to come. And that's my biggest advice. Awesome. The power of the kickoff. Anyone Amen. else with a live question? Go ahead, unmute. Raise your hand so we can see how many people there are with questions. And then the chat was on fire a second ago. So, <laughs> John, over to you. Hi. Hey, Will, great presentation. Awesome. Thank you. Material. Um, uh, how do you 
uh, pick your your mentors. Um, I have a I use mastermind groups in my in my cohort, and uh, you know we have separate subjects for each one. And it sounds very similar to what you do with the, with the mentors. Mm-hmm. How do you pick them? What what's your criteria for that? And what you know how do you keep them engaged? And what what do you look for from them to to inspire th- thinking? Yeah, hundred um, percent. We do an application. The number one criteria is that they're writing between cohorts, right? Because the whole thing is that it's somebody who took the course, learned the lessons, and they can turn around and help the next group. And so um, we've had people we really like who uh, didn't keep writing and didn't have them back as a mentor. Um, So that's the number one thing. Uh, Beyond that, we have an application with a few questions, like written responses, 100 words or so. Um, The thoughtfulness of the responses is a big signal. It's it's as simple as that. Like some people just dash it off and some people really uh, pour their heart into it. Um, and that was it in the first few rounds. We didn't have that much demand. Now there's more demand. And so we really look at, okay, how can we compile the perfect group, people who focus on craft, tactics, perspective. But in the early days, it was, are you writing? And do you care enough to fill out a good application? Really that simple. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Amazing. Eva, would you like to go next? Sure. So my question is about after the community or after the course is over, is there any like continuation of community? Do the students keep connecting? How does that all work? Yeah, yeah. I had this in the presentation. I end up cutting it for time, but I can talk about it now a bit. We've tried so many different things here. Um, like after a third cohort, believe it or not, I tried a Facebook group. It feels so antiquated these days, but we tried a Facebook group. And it was just dead. Nobody used it. Um, uh, so we used to have this thing between cohorts called the Rite of Passage Winter. It'd be so vibrant for five weeks, it would go completely quiet. We... Uh, Solved this a couple of cohorts ago, Matilda, cover your ears, but we had another tool called Geneva, which had really good uh, real-time chat and it had these live video rooms. And so we did an unpaid thing where we built this community in Geneva um, and people jumped in there afterwards. There's probably like 50 people, our most diehard students, and they would continue doing feedback and um, chatting and stuff. So we just created that container again, bottom up. Um, Circle now has real-time chat. So I bet our one after this cohort is going to be in Circle. But the real principle there is that uh, it was unpaid, so it was mostly just creating a container and let the real diehards run with it, uh, rather than like building a whole second thing. Um, and I think it's okay. Like I think there's this narrative like, oh, you're gonna have a 12 month always on community. You totally don't. For the first two years, right of passage was absolutely on for five weeks, uh, times two, so ten weeks, and absolutely dead for 40 weeks. And here we are, right? Um, so yeah, I would. I'll leave it there. But that's that's what we do. Awesome, Jose. Would you like to go next? Sure. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And these uh, fantastic presentation. Thank very you. Cool. Fantastic camera, by the way. I like the little faded in the background. Um, so my three questions revolve, well, my questions revolve around the mentorship. Um, the first cohort, my understanding is there was no mentorship, correct? Mm-hmm. It, it was after the first one. Uh, and then, um, so that was question number one. How long does do the mentor stay for? Is it like a cohort or they have an opportunity to stay on longer? What's that look like? Totally. So first question, there was no mentors in the first three cohorts. Um, we were just trying to get the course over the line. Like it was really just getting the basics down of the curriculum and all that. Um, the fourth cohort, we had mentors. They didn't teach on session. It was just you sort of async and uh, didn't go very well. Our fifth cohort, honestly, we found product market fit when we introduced mentors in our fifth cohort. That was the tipping point for this whole thing. We had seven people uh, and they ran one hour sessions each and we trained them for like two weeks. Um, now we do, to the second part of your question, mentors are only there for one cohort. You reapply to be a mentor again. Um, a lot of people come back. It's usually half are returning, half are new. It keeps things fresh. Uh, so we just do it cohort by cohort. And then the final thing, we now have this you know big team of W2 full-time people, but in the early days, uh, we would, I really recommend like somebody who really loves the community, make them the lead mentor. We would pay them, you know, a couple thousand bucks, not like a big salary. And they would just really run that mentor program. So it became too much for me to try to do that with everything else. So a couple, couple of thoughts there. So then you, and, and my last thing is, yeah. so is there, is, I take it then there would be an onboarding session for the, the mentorship, which it's is your program. Opinion. It's yeah. almost like a cohort within the cohort. It started again with a Zoom call and then like a two week training. Now we do applications like nine weeks out. We bring them all on like seven weeks out. We do five weeks of training. Like the training is just 90 minutes, but it's like a whole training and everything. But again, it started, it's like the snowball. It started just Zoom call, maybe one or two trainings. And now it's a whole program within itself. Thank you. All right. Over to you, Jordan. It's your turn to ask a question. All right. Hey, Will, how's it going? I'm, I'm actually good. going through the cohort right now. So it's been- Oh, a my man. 
experience to see. Great to have you in the cohort. Really, yeah. really impressive. So my question is, I think you said you're running two cohorts per year right now. Is that right? Currently, yep. Yeah. Okay. And that's changed over time. It sounded like in the beginning, you were doing them much more rapid fire kind of back to back. And now you've spaced them out a whole lot more. And so if you have this much bigger team, you said you have a bunch of W2 people, what does it look like in the off season when you're not running these cohorts? Like, are you guys busy? Are you taking breaks and vacation? Like, are you working on this thing steady all year long? And what are the kind of things that you're doing? And do you think you'll run more than two per year? Is that kind of the sweet spot? 100%. So the first two years we did two per year because we were partner with another program called Building a Second Brain. And so that's where Matilda and I met. So we would run four cohorts per year. Uh, it was basically myself, Dave, and Tiago. I'd run Rite of Passage for cohort, then do Second Brain, then Rite of Passage, Second Brain. Second Brain was much bigger. It was like 1,600 people. Um, but we learned so much by, it was intense, but it was during COVID. So we just learned a ton by cohort, 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 cohort. Um, we just went our, amicably went our separate ways like a year ago. Um, so this year we did two. But we're probably going to do three because we didn't have a team. At the beginning of this year, we were three employees. Now we're 16. We have a whole high school team. So our capabilities have really expanded. So I think in the future, we'll do probably three next year, um, plus the high school stuff. But when we didn't have the team, two per year um, was sort of what was possible, given that we were partnered with this other uh, program. Yeah. And so what are you guys focusing on a lot during the off season when you're not running the cohorts? Yeah, well, it's just... We haven't really had that yet. In the past, it was second brain, rite of passage. Now, like we just built this team before this last cohort. So we actually haven't had that yet because next time we're going to do three. Uh, in the, in the the Say next time, uh, next year, there'll be maybe three or four weeks between cohorts and you're uh, maybe a bit more than that, but you're collecting feedback. Uh, we do an in-person retreat. We're remote, but we do an in-person retreat to kind of synthesize all the feedback, do the planning for the next cohort and then build that. And that's sort of what happens in between. Gotcha. So the new team is to prepare for this new, more intense schedule of running multiple cohorts. That's right. It was also just too taxing for just a couple people to run this. So it's sort of, we caught up and, and now we've expanded more to run multiple. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thanks, man. Love it. See you uh, on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag meta. I hate to be the timekeeper because there's so many great questions and we have only so much time, but just know folks that we will Post the replay, first of all, in the video library of this session. You'll be able to rewatch re re it if you'd like. Um, and then, Will, I don't know if you if you keen. We haven't discussed this, but maybe the top questions or themes we're not able to address, we could have you know some 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 sort of asynchronous discussion, or maybe right. we could get your thoughts. Uh, putting doing? you on yeah. the putting you on the spot here. <laughs> for me, yeah, no worries. Uh, awesome. I want to share a couple of notes about the bootcamp just to to finish the session, and then uh, we'll say goodbye. We'll say see you later. Um, Bear with me as I as I share my screen. Um, there you go. What an awesome session! First of all, I just want to say that this was incredibly inspiring. This was awesome to see the evolution as well. And I think Will, you you put it really well. Like you don't have to start with all those touch points, all those things from the start. Like it can evolve in in this way if you have if that's your goal. But it doesn't. This this it definitely doesn't have to be this way, right? Um, in terms of what's next, can you see my screen? Oh, well, good. All right. So next week, we are in the last week of the boot camp. You will uh, learn all about this topic right here, how to invite your first students into your course community. If you haven't done so yet, you'll be able to learn strategies to, to engage your students, to have them join your circle community or your course. Uh, of course, today we learn all about creating an unfor unforgettable community experience. And I think that with Will's presentation and experience, you've got tons of ideas that you can use uh, to, to inspire your, your own setup. So that's going to be really exciting. We will drop the lesson uh, on Monday, the last lesson of the bootcamp on Monday. Emma has worked on it. It's going to be awesome. Then we have Tuesday as usual office hours. So if there's any question, anything that you're not sure how to achieve, like something that has to do with how Circle works, um, setting up your course, inviting your members, or any questions that you have around Circle, really just join office hours and we'll, and we'll answer those live together. Um, we'll finish with our last workshop uh, of the bootcamp next th Thursday, all about um, kind of like minimal viable launch strategies and how you can relaunch your, your course without the headaches and without doing all the things that you, you might think that you need to do. And again, at any point, you can share your progress and get feedback from the group. But now the last thing I want to share with you is we have a special celebration for the end of the bootcamp that's going to happen on November 4th. Let me know in the chat if you already RSVP'd, who here has seen 
the CPC soirée, and I'm going to use my best French accent to, to say it. A couple of you, a few of you, amazing. If you haven't done so yet, we'll drop the link in the chat. Do RSVP because that's going to be a really fun event where we're going to celebrate all your progress, all the things that you've learned, that you've built in this bootcamp. We're going to have an award ceremony as well. You're going to be able to showcase uh, for those of you who want some of the, the courses that you've built, some of the milestones that you've, you've reached. And so that's going to be a really awesome celebration. Make sure you RSVP and save the date. All right, Will, how can people find you? How can people stay connected? Where are you online? Tell us. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm on Twitter. Just uh, DM me on Twitter. Uh, yeah, uh, that's that's the main spot. I've got my personal website uh, and I, I have a whole separate side of my life where I uh, study Chinese and have a podcast in Chinese. So if everybody speaks Chinese, DM me and I'd love to interview you. So yeah. Amazing. We'll post those links in the replay as well. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining, for all your great questions, for Will. Thank you, Will. It was an awesome session. Well, thank you for having me. It was a ton of fun. And see you all on the internet. Thanks, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye.